everybody. Welcome back to the MLB Draft Podcast. I'm your host, former Major League pitcher and certified private wealth advisor, Travis Chicken. I'm joined today by an attorney uh, and former agent and my now partner, Will McGuffey. So today we're going to have a very fun conversation where he and I are actually going to talk about the conversation between what's my number. Um, and we're going to use this from the guise of what's a financial advisor recommending versus what an agent's going to be recommending and how we can confidently answer the question that every one of you probably have. And that would be, how much is a team willing to pay me to sign my professional contract? So the cool part about this topic for me is that there's really two parts of this conversation. Um, and w- one of the things that we're going to focus on is Every one of you have what's called a human capital value, the ability for you to go out and earn income or what you're worth. Uh, The other part of that conversation is what is your market value that scouts and organizations are going to place on you? Uh, So Will and I are going to go back and forth on that to help you got to get the idea um, how to make that determination of what your value is. So let's jump right in. You know, Will, you know, for me, the really exciting part of this discussion is, is really starting with what the player probably has less control of. And outside of going out and what he's proving, what he's capable of proving on the field, you know, which is actually what creates that market value. So I would really like to start the conversation is to leverage your expertise uh, as a past agent and and talk through the framework that you would have with your clients um, as the draft approaches on how you kind of determine what that market value is uh, and what they could ultimately expect that to be. Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing for families and players to realize is that there's two different values. There's a market value and a personal value. Sometimes they line up and sometimes they're completely different. Um, The personal value, which you'll you'll get into the human capital side, which is easier easier to define from an individual standpoint, um, is something you can do without understanding um, how the season went. But as far as determining a market value, um, there's a lot of factors that go into what your market value is. Things like my performance, uh, my schedule, my competition, the weather, the other players in that draft class. And you, and you might be saying, well, how does, how does, you know, everybody looks at my performance. Okay. How exactly does my performance come into play other than I have to play really good? Well, you know, really good players can actually have a really bad four or five month stretch. So you can be a really good player who's at the top of your class. And let's just say you have draft itis is what they call it. And that junior year in college, you don't play well and you end up going in the in the 12th round instead of the third round. Um, that happens all the time. And, and actually, a, a former client of mine that I used to represent, um, we had this conversation last week just talking about um, a couple players from his draft class and players that we knew that that exact thing happened to him. And, and we got into the discussion of, hey, look, you really need to know how good of a player you are and understand that the draft is a snapshot of a four month period. It doesn't define who you are. It doesn't, you know, it just defines where you go in that marketplace. Um, you know, one of the other things is, is, is how does your schedule line up? Um, people don't always think about that, but look, when, when my schedule, if I'm a Friday night starter in high school, then I'm lining up against every Friday night college pitcher in the country. How many eyes am I, am I going to actually have come see me? How many opportunities am I going to have? Am I going to be prioritized in the right way? versus, um, you know, somebody who might be thrown on a Tuesday or a Monday. Mondays were my absolute favorite. If I could find a matchup and actually one year in 2013, we had a Monday matchup uh, on the high school side where it ended up being a first rounder and then against a future major leaguer who went to college and was a top, you know, 50 type player. And I think I think the number it was like 20 to 24 scouting directors showed up at this one high school game, which I have never seen before. Um, so, you know, things like that come into play and, and those are things that, you know, you can control your performance to a certain degree, but you can't control your schedule, you know, and then, you know, competition wise, I'm I'm sure you can speak to that is, you know, you're sitting there and and you grew up in East Texas. Sometimes you play the good team. Sometimes you play the bad team. What, What was that like for you, you know, growing up in East Texas and playing maybe a smaller school? Yeah, no, it's, it's funny, you know, the, probably the way that I've actually got noticed, um, was I just happened to line up against a kid that ended up pitching the major leagues named Zach Segovia, uh, that just happened to schedule a, a, probably a midweek game against us. Uh, we happened to lock horns against him. I, I happened to pitch that night and that was the way that scouts first noticed me. So, you know, it, it really does speak to what you're talking about. Just, you know, the variable of timing, you know, how important is timing. And so that, to me, well, as you were kind of going through that, one of the things that I was thinking about was as an agent, 
um, you know, one of your things, one of your responsibilities is to really go out and help him leverage every opportunity that he has to go out and basically get himself noticed. So is that something that you would actually try to help um, facilitate making sure that, you know, at the end of the day, the, the high school coach or the college coach, they're going to start them where they want. But, you know, is that something that you are bringing to the table? Like, hey, how can we maximize his exposure? Absolutely. And, and you did. You're all right. On the college side, you're going to be um, a little less flexibility. Um, you're just going to fit into the rotation a lot of times what's best um, for your team. With that being said, there are some coaches, you know, college coaches are very cognizant of how those things play. Um, and it, it, look, if it's a Friday night starter, he's going to match up and it's going to be what it is. But some of those other guys that have um, roles or limited roles, they might match them up on a Tuesday knowing it's it's a good opportunity for them to, to have eyes on them. On the high school side, absolutely. That was one of the biggest things that you could do at the beginning of the year and more so for pitchers than for position players. Position players, you know, you're going to go out there every single day. The schedule is what it is. But you would try to manufacture um, a, a pitching schedule for the year that would allow teams to have more people present. Um, you know, like we said, the the Monday night thing was a huge thing. I always love trying to find guys that that we could get a scheduled Monday night game just because nobody plays on Monday night in college baseball. So you know that it's maybe limited high school across the country. Um, the other thing, you know, and this we did this a couple of years ago, uh, my last year as an agent, um, had a high school player that was playing in a tournament um, and, and it was at the same city as a huge SEC matchup was going on. And so what we did is we were like, all right, we know that this first rounder is matching up against another first rounder. Let's see if we can bump our guy, you know, our high school guy up to the same night and then actually called the other coach and said, hey, can we change the game time? Can we switch this around so that, you know, we're going to go at four o'clock knowing that they're going to be over at that, you know, college stadium at seven o'clock and we can get all these eyes on us. And it's it's something that you actively do when you're an agent advisor. You're trying to help define the market value and help your player have more opportunities um, than they otherwise would have. So let's let's start to kind of unpack uh, what market value is. I mean, you know, we all know, um, especially this year, that COVID is going to say, hey, you can get one hundred thousand dollars this year. And then the remaining part of your bonus is going to be spread out over two years. We can look back at historical records and say, hey, you know, the first pick in the country is worth this. And we know that there's slotted values. We know that the teams have uh, their bonus pools. And so there's there's a there's an element of an element of restriction around what each kind of pick is worth. And so at the end of the day, you know, from an outside perspective, looking in the player is. Um, is kind of pigeonholed into two parts, right? Number one is, okay, where is he going to fall on the draft board? And that's one of those things that is, it, it nobody has clarity on it. Perfect game doesn't, Baseball America doesn't, D1 Baseball doesn't. Nobody understands where the teams are going to pick until draft day comes because there's so many variables that kind of go into that. We all get that. We're all very accustomed to that. But then at the end of the day, you know, as, as an agent, your job is to, once the player is picked and selected and drafted, is to negotiate um, a deal that the player will take, right? Like, and maximize that number. So kind of walk me through your experience with, number one, how did you determine, you know, we all know the term signability, um, but how did you kind of come up with that number that says, hey, I'm willing to forego, especially for a high school kid, I'm willing to forego the opportunity to, you know, pitch in the SEC or play major college baseball or attend a major college university and get a very uh, prestigious degree to start my professional career now. How did you get to that number? It, it was an exercise where I went in and I explained exactly that. There are two different values, your personal value and your market value, and first made sure that they understood that there could be a difference there and that our goal was to, one, achieve or exceed your personal value first. If that was something that we could do, then we knew the market value would, pull, would fall into place. And once we said, okay, we have a market value, then the same thing applies. We want to achieve or exceed the market value. And the hard part, of, hard part about it was 
um, trying to get families to understand that you do separate those two out. They're two distinct numbers. Sometimes they line up and sometimes they're very far apart. Um, but that you can define your personal value, your personal number well in advance of the draft. And it's always subject to change based on variables or, or things happen in your life, whatever it might be. But trying to let them understand, look, you can choose your personal value. So well in advance of the draft, I would go and sit down with the family. And I usually at that time, I would wait a little bit and I'd have an idea about a general range where I thought the market might lay, but there was still a lot of play within that, you know, within that frame because the market's defining itself. Um, and we would sit down and just discuss, say, hey, what does this mean to you? What is this number? What what does $1 million actually mean after taxes? You know, it's going to be about $600,000. Well, you're in the minor leagues for this long. You pay me this amount. You go buy that truck. You know, you're, you're sitting there looking at $300,000. You know, you're, you're trying to basically help them understand the journey ahead of them. Um, and, and I went even so far as, in, and there's a couple guys that could probably, they'll probably laugh about it. I'd take a checkbook in there. Um, and I would write checks that obviously they couldn't cash because one, it was, uh, it's not, it's, NCAA, it's against NCAA rules, but two, I didn't have a million dollars just laying around, but I got them used to the idea of like, so you were really hoping that they didn't try to go cash them, right? Yeah, no, I made sure that I got those on the way out the door, but, uh, we would sit there and we would say, Hey man, I'm, I am the Chicago Cubs. Here is $600,000. I'd write the check, put their name on it and I'd give it to them and say, what do you think about that? You know, and, and I would say, go through the exercise. And then the best part was when the guys would actually tear up the check and be like, no, no, no. And, and you're kind of, yeah, you're prepping them to say no with the real live check in front of them. Granted, we all knew that there was no value in the check. Um, but that's how we would go through the process. We would start discussing that as far as like, and then I would prep them and say, hey, look, your market value is going to define itself in, in the amount of information we're going to get exponentially increases the closer we get to the draft. And I'll know a whole lot more the week of the draft, three days out from the draft, I'll probably know twice as much as I did three days prior and, and keep going down. And sometimes you're not going to know where you're going to get drafted, what that actual market value is until the draft happens. So that market is constantly defining itself. Um, and one of the reasons why it does that is, um, you know, you're subject to the other players in the draft. You're subject to 30 teams and how they're valuing players. And while I might have a good sense of what your value traditionally is, I can't sit there and speak for 70 other players and say, hey, man, this is what that guy's going to sign for. So sometimes a lot of guys will price themselves out of the market and it helps you go up the draft board and get to your market value moves up in those last couple of minutes. Sometimes guys panic and, and come in back into play, sign for less than what they should, and it drives you down because you're sitting on your number. So that's kind of the basic framework um, in, in a quick nutshell about how we would walk through some of those things. Yeah, no. So I'm going to pick on you a little bit as a former agent, you know, because one of the things that, you know, we as financial experts that deal with this year in and year out, you know, ultimately what we're trying to do here is turn a very emotional decision into a very practical business decision, you know. And so as you as the agent going in and have these these practice, these skill set, trying to build this skill set to be able to turn down an emotional decision, uh, that's that's incredible to me, but as, as a financial professional, I kind of look at it like, well, as, as, as much as I appreciate that you're doing that, are you actually qualified to provide that type of, you know, financial advice, even though that's not really what you were doing, you were practicing there. But, you know, what we know is unfortunately the world of financial advice um, as a whole is re really not prepared to equip major league draft picks um, with the type of advice that they need. You know, one thing we know for sure is that um, there's a lot of advice available to them. And, and most of the people know about it because of the massive amount of money that, you know, the Morgan Stanley's Merrill Lynch's of the world do to advertise to try to get that business. Um, but what you should really be considering is what kind of advice is ideal for you as a, as a major league draft pick. You know, because the problem is, and you hit on this a minute ago, is talking about tax. You know, if you search at the bottom of their websites, one of the things that one of the disclosures that basically all of them say is, you know, we are not permitted to provide tax or legal advice. Please consult your tax or legal advisor before making any financial decisions. If I back this up, you know, this is a um, 
this is a financial business decision that ultimately you're going to make whether you sign. And so what I would, what I would ask you is, are you really prepared to take advice from somebody um, that's really not even prepared to provide you that advice? So, you know, this is where we come in and work with every single one of our clients um, prior to the draft to help them, you know, navigate the, the controllable part of the draft, you know, because like you hit on earlier, we know that you can't do anything outside of go out on the field and do your very best to help lift and, and elevate your market value. But what we also know is kind of like I hit on earlier, you have value already set inside you. Um, that degree from Vanderbilt or, you know, you down in Baton Rouge, LSU, like we know that we can value these degrees. Uh, we know that we can value uh, the type of jobs that you would get coming out of these degrees. And so I thought I'd just walk through a very high level framework of how we start the conversation to to really build the bridge between what is my what is my number? How do I come to that number? And so as an example, hey, Trav, um, real, real quick before you, you get started on that, and, and this is something that I'll admit that that I wasn't prepared to I didn't have somebody like AWM. I didn't know enough about the overall implications. I knew the numbers we were trying to get to, but I I, I will be the first one to admit that you know, I relied on people to, to break down a tax scenario, give me a, a basic whole number, but that, that the entire industry on the agent side, for the most part, they're, they're kind of lacking in that ability to really break down and show what that means. And so, you know, I didn't understand that until, you know, I was even in the, on the business management side of things for a little while and seeing the real impact and value that, that this type of breakdown that you're about to do actually has and why it is as important, if not more important than anything else. It's, it's more important than the than their market value, to be honest with you. So it's something that should be done well in advance and and not enough people understand that and not enough people are doing it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I mean, it, you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to provide value. Um, you know, this is something that a certified financial planner should know how to do. Uh, but more importantly, somebody that's a certified financial planner that does this day in and day out with people just like you. And this is why it's important. You know, so if I just use a very basic number and I, you can look this up on you know, the Internet and there's a lot of websites that kind of produce these numbers, you know, an average college uh, you know, degree or an average job coming out of getting a major degree from a major university is roughly about sixty thousand dollars a year starting out. And so one of the things that one of the calculations that we do is we can take the present value of that savings rate and 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 start forecasting what that's going to look like into the difference of starting it when you're 22 versus saying, hey, you know, worst case scenario, I play in the minor leagues for six years. Things don't work out. I have to go back to school. Um, and so what is the lost savings opportunity there that kind of comes into there? And so. If we use $60,000, we take out about a 20% savings rate. One of the things that we know is that allows you over the course to be able to have a present value of about $120,000. Now, that doesn't sound like a big number until you kind of extrapolate that out and, and forecast that out to when you would use it when you're 60 years old, when you retire. And so, again, this is very high level, very basic math, very basic numbers. Uh, but if we assume a very, very generous savings rate of just about 4% interest. Um, what that ultimately equates to is starting, going to college and starting your career at 22 years old versus starting your minor league career and starting earnings when you're 28 years old ends up being about a $500,000 decision. Uh, and that's an after-tax decision. Um, so what we have to then do is say, okay, if it's $500,000 in after-tax money, now, how do I extrapolate out what that would be kind of pre-tax? Because at the end of the day, that's your signing bonus, right? And so a very small number, basically that equates to about a $715,000 bonus. Now, some of you are out there saying, well, hey, I'm probably going to earn a lot more than $60,000 coming out of college because, you know, I may be going to Vanderbilt and I'm going to get a law degree. Obviously, those numbers start jacking up a lot more. So you can kind of see how every situation is going to be completely different. Um, every degree is going to yield a different result. Um, and this is why it's very important for you as a draft pick to individualize these calculations so you can you can really go into that with leverage and saying and, and, and removing the emotional decision saying, hey, 
that $715,000 bonus that I'm being offered, I know that I'm worth more than that because here I have it on paper. Uh, now, you know, that that just removes it and makes it a business decision. We all know, I know, everybody in the industry knows that it's really exciting to go ahead and start your professional career. Um, but the more information that you have, the better off you're going to be, the more prepared you're going to be. And the and and you as, as an agent, as a former agent, the more prepared you both can be to go into those negotiations to both do whatever we're all trying to do is maximize your net worth. Yeah. And I think the, the biggest thing that for me w- with the, the preparation going into this and having that number in advance was removing that emotion from draft day. And I saw it time and time again, um, you know, and, and that was the reason we went through those exercises. I even had a player one time that, you know, basically agreed to an amount and was going to be the next pick of a certain team. And, like called me after the fact. And I said, no, 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 absolutely not. Like just remind you, you made this decision on this amount of money based on these factors a month ago. You know, are you certain? And you just had to bring it back to them. Um, and and it's so easy to get caught up in the emotion. And you want that to be just a another day, even though it is not another day in the grand scheme of things. The other thing I think that this does is, and, and this is a story I, I just heard recently um, which I thought was amazing. If, if you sit there and you understand, hey, I've got a personal value. I, I Going into, into my season, I know what, and this maybe is more of a high school antidote than it is a college antidote. But go, let's say going into your senior season of high school, you're like, you know what? My number is going to be, you know, $3 million is what it is. Instead of sitting there trying to get your market and beat your market and guess and, and do all these things and put the pressure on you, you're sitting out there just playing free and easy. You know, you're playing baseball knowing, hey, man, I know what I want. I know what it's going to take to get me there. If I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. And this is where that story takes a little bit of a turn. I was talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago, and there was a high school player a couple of years ago, um, and he's in college now, and I saw him playing, and I'm like, man, that, that player is really good. Somebody started telling me his senior year of high school, he just decided to say, you know what? I want to be a better baseball player. I want to further my career. If someone wants to sign me for, and I don't know what the number was, a couple million dollars, that's fine. But I'm going to spend this entire year working on becoming a switch hitter because that's going to provide me more value in my quest to be a major league baseball player. And I saw that player play and would have had no idea that he had just learned how to switch hit within the previous couple of years. And I think it's it's a it was an unbelievable you know forward thinking thought process um, because now that player you know let's say his number was two million I'd I'd drop well north of that on him just for, by seeing him for a couple you know a couple of days a couple of abs and and what he did in the field so I think it gives you that flexibility too to continue your development and actually use that time instead of trying to just get somewhere in the draft continue your development as a baseball player for that six month, nine month lead up period, because that's lost development time. If you're just focusing on the draft versus focusing on, Hey, I want to be a better baseball player. I want to do the things that I need to do to get me to the big leagues eventually. Cause that's where we all want to be. We don't want to be in the, in the draft. It's fun, but we all want to be big leaguers, right? No, ab- absolutely. I think that's a very important point. You know, one of the things um, that we all know, and the longer that we're uh, working with major leaguers, we know this, the majority of our major leaguers have earned a lot more money in the major leagues than they earned in the draft. And so if you kind of back that out and you think in terms of the development, you know, forward looking, if I'm a high school kid and I'm, I know that if, Hey, at worst case scenario, if I go to college, I'm worth this to me, that removes a lot of the risk of, Hey, yeah, my dream is to ultimately be a major leaguer and, Maybe I go to college and and get hurt, or maybe I go and I don't develop, or you know, there's those risks out there that, that you could miss out on the opportunity to play professional baseball. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about development, right? And one of the things that we we see the most of, and that we try to reinforce to our clients is the best investment that you're ever going to make is the one that you make in yourself. Whether that's investing in your nutrition plan, whether that's investing in your personal development, whether that's investing in your physical development, um, to be able to confidently accept the terms of a contract that's going to help aid you in those years in the minor leagues when things are really tough, 
uh, if you can remove the financial distraction from that because you've done some really advanced planning from the get-go, um, your opportunity for success to make life-changing long-term wealth uh, just becomes that much greater, right? Like, what, what's, there, what's there's the nothing stat? Is, isn't it like 75% of first rounders that get to the big leagues have career earnings of 10 million or more and then 25 million and 50 million. What are, what are the numbers on that Trav that back that up? Isn't it like yeah. 53% on the 25 million? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it's about 50% of major leaguers. Uh, I'm sorry, 50% of first rounders play a day in the major leagues and about 75% of those earn 10 million or more. So even, you know, we know that even signing out of the draft in the first round is not guarantee one, uh, to make a lot of money. Now there's, there's the Albert Pujols that sign in the 14th round and make, you know, I don't know, $200 million. Like there's always those anomalies. Um, but here's the number that's striking. And, and this always is a personal number for me. Um, and it's probably going to be eclipsed this year. So Major League Baseball has been played for 100 and, I don't know, 20 years, right? Um, it, it's It's crazy. Uh, so a couple years ago, and this is a really funny story, a couple years ago, um, the Major League Baseball Player Alumni Association called me because it was time for uh, me to renew my alumni dues. Well, I had moved and they lost my address. So they picked up the phone. Hey, where do you want us to send this? I asked them, I said, can we not just set this up on auto pay? Uh, because that would make it a lot easier, right? And they're like, well, we've looked into that and the costs really don't out, you know, work out because there's so few of you. Right. And I'm just thinking, my gosh, this game's been around 120 years. So there's less than 5000 people uh, in the Alumni Association. And when you back that out right now, there's still been less than 20,000 people that have ever played one day in the major leagues. Let yeah, that that's... set in for a second. <laughs> right. Like 20,000. There's there's more and a half uh, attendance at the, you know, Florida Marlins game right now, or, you know, pick a stadium like Kansas city and reduced attendance probably is drawing more um, people than have ever played a day in the major leagues. Now I think that 20,000 is finally going to be eclipsed this year. Last time I looked, it was in the 19,000s, uh, but it still it just kind of 19, brings it in context. 19,940 like, as of. There we go. We got 60 to go and we're almost there. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but so like, so what we need to, you know, just kind of breaking that statistically down, like, Hey, you know, you need to make a really good financial decision out of the draft. Um, because, you know, we all know that the statistics just really aren't on your side to create generational wealth. I mean, it's just, it is what it is. And I don't say that to scare anybody. And I certainly don't say that to advocate that you should go to college or, you should not sign it at the end of the day. Like being a professional athlete is a, is an experience that I wouldn't take back for anything in the world. But um, if you go into it with the confidence to make a really good business decision, one, you're going to remove the, you know, internal risk that you have of trying to play outside of your skill set. You know, and I think that's where an agent can come in and really add value is helping them kind of understand Hey, this is what your market value is. These are the things that we have seen with our other clients have helped them do things. Um, and at the end of the day, our job is to maximize that, whether it be now or three years from now or 10 years, from, whatever that is. Right. Yeah. And I, I think whenever, you know, we talk, I think we sometimes just say, hey, you know, the agents or advisors and involvement in this with the player and something that that I, I definitely coming into this podcast, you know, had thought a lot about and something I wanted to address is you know, parents, you need to be intimately involved in this situation, in this, in this oh, no. decision-making process. Um, you know, you know your child better than anyone else. Do not be afraid to give them guidance. Um, nothing, I guess, I don't want to say the word bother me, but I guess hurt me more than when, you know, a parent was would say to me, you know, it's his decision. I don't want him, I don't want to have him mad at me for helping him change his mind one way or another and something doesn't go right. And, and this is, is me as a parent, like as a parent, you know, I only want what's best for my kids. And, and if my, my kids are mad at me for trying to help them make the best decision possible, I can live with that. Um, but if I just stand idly by while they make the decision um, like this, that impacts their life negatively because I was too scared to speak up, 
I, I think that's a regret. I don't think I could even live with that on my conscience. Um, you know, it, and, and it just goes back to this decision is going to impact the player more than anybody else. It's going to impact it more than mom and dad. It's going to impact the life more than the agent or the advisor. It's going to impact it more than me and you, Trav. It's going to impact them more than Major League Baseball or the university they're supposed to go to. All those people will be around and will be fine no matter what the decision is. The biggest biggest person or the, the person that has the most to lose is that individual. So parents, you need to be involved and give as much advice as you can because it goes back to you know them better than the agent does. You know them better than we do. You know, step in, do a good job of, of giving your life lessons on your on your child on this one last and probably biggest decision that they'll make for a couple of years, you know, until they get married or children of things of that nature. Yeah, no, I think that's that's fantastic advice, you know, because we all know a 17, 18 year old kid or even a 21, 21, 22 year old kid. They probably don't have the skill set, number one, to have a really good business decision made. Um, We also know that just life experience hasn't really done a whole lot for them in creating financial literacy. Um, We know that they probably don't have the skill set for the most part to interview people um, because they probably haven't done a whole lot of interviews outside of, you know, the scouts asking them, hey, who who are you going to jump in a hole with? You know, like. Uh, we all know the, the crazy questions that scouts ask. So I think that's great advice because we all know parents, you know, just the fact that we've lived a lot longer and lived life a lot longer. Um, and we know our children better than anybody can help them make these good decisions. So uh, obviously we want to be sensitive to your time. And this is a very important subject to us. Uh, it's, it obviously should be a very important subject to you and, and, and your son that's going through this process. So uh, thanks so much for watching today. You know, this Again, you know, I say this every week. It's, we want this to be the premier space for you, uh, the next generation of major league players, to make really good financial decisions um, and, and just help you go through this from people that have been in your shoes. And so if you found this episode helpful, just take a quick minute and hit the thumbs up button or the subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, or if you're watching on, on a podcast, if you could leave us a five-star review, that would be fantastic. We'd really appreciate it because at the end of the day, it helps us get this content to people who are searching for it like you. So um, if there's any questions that you have, please feel free to leave it in the YouTube comments below or even better, email me at Travis at awmcap.com or will at awmcap.com and we'd get those answers back to you as soon as possible. And lastly, we have a lot of really helpful content out there. Uh, Click on the playlist box at the top of the screen uh, and we, you can see some of the questions to the biggest an- or the answers to the biggest questions that we hear day in and day out. So thanks again for listening. As always, stay hungry, stay humble, and always be a pro.